Hello everybody and welcome and thank you for joining us today. As you know, the Life Institute has been running a strong campaign to make people aware of the dangers of assisted suicide, particularly in relation to very vulnerable people. So as part of that campaign on Thursday, February 4th, we're going to be screening Fatal Flaws, a hugely important documentary made by Kevin Dunn, which explores this area and looks at exactly why assisted suicide endangers vulnerable people. That's going to be showing at Thursday, again, 4th of February at 8 p.m. And you can register on the lifeinstitute.net. But we're delighted that today to talk to us about the documentary, we have Kevin Dunn. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Niamh. How you doing? It's uh, it's great to be here, and uh, of course, uh, I'm of Irish descent, so this is uh, this is warming my heart today. I uh, I never thought I would be doing this, uh, traveling around the world, talking all around the world on this very uh, dark subject. I mean, people really don't want to talk about this subject. In fact, I, I think it's uh, it's just one of those that we kind of think, okay, well, that's okay for some people. We'll just let it go, let it, but. As I have moved into this whole area of filming and filming stories of people that have been adversely affected by these laws, uh, my, my, my jaws dropped. Uh, I, I, I just totally uh, immersed in exposing what this issue is all about. And that is what Fatal Flaws. It's a production. Uh, it's a film. It's a documentary uh, that I produced. My company, Dunn Media, with the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. Uh, they mm -hmm. were my partner in the film, Alex Schadenberg. And we traveled to the Netherlands, through Belgium, through uh, the United States, and through Canada uh, to kind of ask that philosophical question, the most important philosophical question of our time, should we be giving doctors the right in law to end the life of another individual? Because prior to this, prior to this whole movement, this was never part of healthcare. Doctors yeah. were always healers, they were never killers. So maybe I'll, I'll run the trailer if you like, uh, the, the yeah. trailer for the film, and, and, and you can have a look and maybe we can come back and talk about it after that. Welcome to Death with Dignity. I've never been welcome to Death with Dignity before. <laughs> For the past two years, I've traveled to four different countries on a quest to see what effects euthanasia and assisted suicide laws have on individuals and society. This is an issue that's about making the medical professional more comfortable with killing people. There's no killing going on. It's a request of a patient to take his or her life by their own doctor. If you were just to replace the image of the needle or the pill with the gun, I think that would make a much more vivid picture of something that would be transculturally wrong. One side says that these laws will protect us. Just 10 seconds before I put the injection in, I say, look in the eyes and I say, is this what you really want? The other says, we've gone too far. So it's the only procedure that I have at my disposal in the state where I'm protected completely from civil or criminal liability and I don't even have to fill out any paperwork. Boundaries of euthanasia in the Netherlands seem to be blurred and the situation seems to be shifting. Who's telling the other side of the story? Uh, I'm afraid no one. So we're heading into a tipping point in the assisted suicide issue in the US. You've given the government the power to decide who can die. It can morph to how you look how you think, what your politics are. It's very dangerous. He was very politely asking me if I wanted to die, and he would have made it happen. If I had to go ahead and do what the doctors wanted me to do, I wouldn't have had her. What was that? Well, they wanted me to do assisted suicide death on her. I have a death wish for about six years, mm -hmm. and I've tried to get um, uh, euthanasia for about four years and I, I don't get it. You don't get it? And I just uh, want to fight for it. I have to ask the question, who has failed her? I want to give you a big hug. Uh, <laughs> you so, may. <laughs> so, okay, 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 good, good. At the moment they gave her the injection, they said they gave it so that she could go to sleep. But in fact, they just killed my mother. It's like being a lawyer for the defense and a lawyer for the prosecution in the same courtroom. And if you're not bothered by that, I'm also the executioner. Is it murder? Well, it's a murder on request. Like a physician assisted suicide. It's a suicide uh, with help. Not once did she ever say to them, I want to end my life. What did you say? I, I, 
I'm, I'm on. Don't cry. It's all done now. It's over. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things you said there, Kevin, of course, is that there's no real discussion around this. And in Ireland, we've been saying, you know, on behalf of the Life Institute, that we feel like the country is sleepwalking into legalising assisted suicide, especially now with COVID, with the lockdown. Everybody's minds are so focused on, on the pandemic and everything that's happening around that. And we have a bill actually going through our parliament, which is set to legalise what they call dignity in dying, which, of course, is assisted suicide. And we're having this discussion with the media at the moment where we're saying, let's at least be honest about this. Let's at least have transparency. Stop pretending it's something it's not, because what you're doing, as you said, Kevin, is you're drastically and dramatically changing the law to give doctors for the very first time the right to help somebody commit suicide, to die by suicide. And that's, you know, a, a drastic change for healthcare in this country, for doctors, from all of the evidence we can see, it will put vulnerable people in danger. But what led you to make this documentary? What brought you, as you said, from, you know, I'm sure you've made lots of other films and you probably were like most people that assisted suicide was something that did not impact on your life. What led you to make the documentary? Well, I mean, I've always been a, uh, I've always been pro-life, if you will. I, I have six children of my own, um, I, adoption uh, and, and uh um, placing a baby for adoption has been part of our family life, um, at least my wife's, and, and that was impacted uh, my life as well. Um, and um, so, so life and the passing on of life um, and the importance of the dignity of the human person has always been a very big part of who I am and what I try to do when I make my film. So when Alex Schattenberg of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition he was sounding alarm bells about this long before here in Canada. He's the international director of the Euthanasia Prevention yeah. Coalition. He was sending he was sending alarm bells about this like long before. And I thought, well, what's what's this all about? I said, Alex, yeah. one day when you when you feel like doing a film, I'm I'm happy to to work with you. And all of a sudden, it, the law became started to be talked about. The the bill uh, started to be talked about here in Canada. And I thought, oh my gosh, are we going to move from a healthcare system? that heals, that always has, has been about healing and protecting and life giving to a healthcare system that now provides death. And, and, and believe it or not, I know this will be hard to believe for some of the viewers, but we're rapidly moving in many jurisdictions to death on demand, like mm. in, in the Netherlands right now, where they're talking about the completed life scenario, where if I feel that my life is complete, if I feel my life has no more meaning, then I would like to end my life and I want a doctor to help me. Yeah. This, is well, where, this is where this leads. It does. And one of the things, when, when we were researching this area and one of the countries we looked at naturally was Canada because you've only had assisted suicide since 2015 and you've seen the rates, the numbers of people dying by assisted suicide just shooting up in that time. And it's, it's a frightening thing to see how quickly culture changes, how quickly this becomes to be embraced. And one of the things we also saw, I think from the Canadian experience, was that it very quickly becomes a cost issue, that you have parliament, the, the, the um, budgetary committee in, in Ottawa, for example, saying, well, you know, we've had last year assisted suicide saved us $100 million or perhaps more than that. And they, they're starting to look at assisted suicide as a means of cutting healthcare costs. You have papers published in medical journals making this point that this can be a way of bringing down healthcare costs, especially with the aging populations. And it's really, to me, that is a really frightening thing, this massive shift in the culture. I also saw a news story which um, explained that and one of the hospices in Canada was going to lose its funding because it won't provide assisted suicide. And when you see things like that, you really start to think to yourself, this is not just about somebody having choice or one person seeking to end their life because they feel perhaps life is unbearable for them. This impacts on our culture in many ways. Yeah, it's, it's very true. And you, you've hit the hammer on the head. Um, uh, important distinction, though, uh, as you mentioned, euthanasia and assisted suicide, um, uh, they're both 
they both end the same way with, with, with mm. someone dying in the process. In Canada, under our medical aid and dying law, most of those procedures are euthanasia, where a doctor will inject the patient with a deadly, uh, a, a lethal substance. So that is the majority mm. of the way it happens here in Canada for medical aid and dying. Some are uh, assisted suicide, where uh, people take uh, lethal drugs themselves, or in some cases where they can't, in, in cases where people have disabilities, other people uh, help them ingest it. And, and it's, uh, a, it's a very difficult subject to talk about, but the reality of the situation yeah. is it always ends up uh, in, in someone, uh, someone's death. The cost issue is, is a yeah. very delicate one because it can be argued either way. Uh, but the bottom line is now people are coming out, uh, many people, in fact, uh, uh, as you say, uh, some of our, our parliamentarians have said, look at how much we've saved in healthcare. I mean, when you think about it, what is the most expensive year of your, uh, for, to the healthcare system of your life? Well, in many cases, it's, it's your final year or final years. And so if yeah. we jump in soon, of course, that saves someone. So how can we put life in the matters of dollars and cents when for millennia, we have always, always saved. Um, we've always been healers. Doctors have always been healers. They have never been uh, killers. And so this is a very important thing, especially when people talk about autonomy. They say, well, it's my body. Uh, I should be mm -hmm. able to decide. And, and of course, we, we have to respect people's autonomy. We have to respect it. But, but what people don't understand is when we, we are giving doctors that right, it's not about us. Sadly, we've had suicide for, 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 for forever. And, and we've, we've yeah. always disdained it. We've always fought against it. But now we're giving that right to suicide over to the doctor saying, and so when we give doctors the right in law, because this is the issue, we give it the right in law, well, it automatically gives them the right. And yes, there is discussion, but at the end of the day, it is their decision. And so once we do that, then we see these incremental expansions of the law, the health savings, if you will, and it, yeah. becomes, a, a, it becomes very, very muddy. And we've seen that, as you just mentioned, it, with the hospice situation in Delta, BC, where the, they're, they have been said that they've been told they will no longer get, it's this very small hospice, they will no longer get funding uh, for their hospice because they will not provide medical aid and dying. And of course, right next door, there's a, there's a hospital where people could go if they wanted it, but they're saying, yeah. no, if people want it, you should have it. These are government dollars and you should do it. And the hospice is saying, that's this it, is not yeah. part of our. Mm -hmm. That's it. And it's, it's, I think that's what happens to you when the law change and the culture changes that it becomes, people are compelled then, like this hospice, they're, they want to compel the hospice to behave in a way that's completely antithetical and for them. Like they don't, they were set up. I read the story and the people who found the hospital, uh, the hospice said, you know, that they were like every hospice in Ireland. They fundraised for years. It was a community who got together who did it to, to make sure that people had actual dignity in dying, that they were got the care and the love and the support that they needed. And now they're going to lose the, the hospice because they don't, they don't believe that it's part of their function to, to kill people because they're old and vulnerable. And it brings us back, I think, Kevin, to some of the very compelling stories that you had in both of your documentaries in Euthanasia Deception and in Fatal Flaws. And they really go to the heart of the matter for me, because this is, at the end of the day, you know, we use language about choice and we talk about funding and, and we try to make this all about a Economy. But the people who are most vulnerable in this world, people who are older, and we see it with our own parents, you know, when they get older, they get more vulnerable, they're more reliant on society. Um, the people who have a disability or people who have mental health illnesses, people who we would always have said, you know, they're that person, perhaps be, be careful of, suicide, of suicidal uh, tendencies, you know, make sure that there's supports in place, do everything we can to prevent people who maybe feel weary of the world or who feel despondent or broken, make sure that they don't take that terrible step where they end their own lives. And they were legalizing assisted suicide, which gives exactly the opposite message, which is if, you, if life is too much for you, you can end your life and we'll help you to do so. It's so true uh, because many people believe that this issue is about people at the very end of their life in severe suffering, in, in severe pain, when in reality, when in reality, the number one, re those cases are very, very few. They still do exist uh, and, and usually exist because of poor health care system. 
But the reality of the situation is the number one reason why people are asking for this is fear of the future, fear of losing my autonomy, fear of suffering, fear of what is to come. And I look at this situation as a filmmaker walking and think, if that is the number one reason, and these aren't these aren't my statistics, these these are coming from with death with dignity, you know, it's it's yeah. about losing my autonomy, it's about losing the things. And, and we have always been a civilization that has tried to cast out fear and bring hope. Yeah. And now we're putting in laws that say there is no hope. There is no yeah. hope. You decide this is it on your worst day. You decide this, you can get it. And 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 now we're even seeing situations where they want to take away the, the, the period where people are thinking about this and say, if you decide, you could actually get what you want on the same day. And and I look at this as a simple humanitarian, right? leave faith, leave God out of it for a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got a situation where for millennia, since the time of Hippocrates, uh, before Christianity, You've got uh, you've got this Hippocrates, the father of medicine, saying, "I will give no poison, even if someone were to ask for it." Yeah. And and, and so he knew then that we couldn't trust ourselves because when we are at our lowest, and God forbid we we get to that time, but we're all going to face times when we have received that really bad news. Where are we going to be? Are we going to be people that that basically say, "I give up"? Or are we going to be people that reach out? And I think this is the big issue. If fear is driving this debate, fear of losing my autonomy, fear of 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 peeing in a bag, fear of you know, fear of fear of all of the things that may come, fear of future pain. What do we do as a society? Most of the care, uh, most of the hospital systems, the healthcare systems in the world are broken. I traveled through Australia and in Perth. There yeah. was a, there was a. a uh, there was a poll done and 70% of the people said, fix the healthcare system first before you introduce these laws. Because if people can't get proper healthcare, proper palliative care, proper specialty palliative care, then, well, what's the option? Oh, let me have the medical aid in dying. Let me have the death with dignity. We're better than that. Yeah, I agree. And I think you summed it up. They were better than that. And one of the things that's most interesting about the Irish debate is that the palliative care specialists, so the doctors who provide the care at at end of life and who relieve suffering, who relieve pain, are adamantly opposed to the legalization of assisted suicide. And in one poll of their their own members, 88% of them said that they opposed this bill. They opposed the bill being currently put before our parliament. And there's a huge sense that they're not being listened to, that they're not being listened to by politicians, you know, who, do, who are just ignoring what the, the actual experts who deal with people who are very ill and who fear pain and suffering are telling them. And I think that's extraordinary. It's extraordinary that our legislators would, because they're, they've been pushed along by their own ideology, would choose just to ignore what these experts are telling us. But what they say to us is so hopeful because they say they give real examples of people who come to them in great distress, who are fearful, just like what you said, Kevin, you know, who are really afraid of, I've, I've been given a diagnosis of terminal cancer. What will this mean for me? Will I, in, will I endure terrible pain and suffering? Will, will there be anybody there to support me? And I feel that when society says, you know what, let's just legalize assisted suicide, it's really our way of washing our hands of the people who need us most. And it's a terrible reflection on where we are and of our, of our failure to love, our failure to love better, you know, and to give people the support that they need. But you spoke to a lot of really amazing people in your documentary, Kevin. And can you talk to us about some of those and some of the impact that they made on you and the stories they shared with you? So I'll tell you about two different stories. The first is uh, the first is Candace, Candace uh, Lewis. Now, Candace is from uh, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, Candace has lived with cerebral palsy and uh, spina bifida her whole life. Uh, one might say she's had a very difficult life. Uh, but when I went to visit her and uh, she's been in, hospi- in and out of hospital for most of her life, um, when I went to visit her and her mom, uh, Sheila, happiest people in the world, happiest mm-hmm. people in the world. Um, and they told me about this one night. And I said to Candace, I said, I hope you'll be part of this interview. And she said, yes, this is my story. She was so excited to tell her story. And yeah. she tells the story how one night when she was very, very low, very uh, at a very bad uh, state because of her, uh, because of an illness that had um, 
uh, that was taking her, and, and it was taking her. Uh, the doctors were worried she was yeah. going to die, but they came into the room and they started to talk to her about assisted. They said, we just had the, we've had this new, new law for medical aid and dying. And have you considered it? And Candace is going, she's, she's like, uh, she's like 20 years old. She's like, what's going on? And, and then uh, she, they take mom out of the hallway. You know, you should really think about this. You know, she keeps coming back here and they start talking to her about this. And that, that's actually uh, not part of the law. You're not supposed to do that, but it's happening more and more. Yeah. And again, you've got this false sense of compassion. And I, I don't hold the doctor, you know, I, I don't disdain the doctor uh, because he, he was doing it out of sense of compassion, uh, I, I believe, but a false sense of compassion. Yeah. Mom said, no. Well, well, what ends up happening, she takes Candace out of the hospital. She thinking she's going to die. Candace actually gets better. And, and, and a year later, she's escorting her sister down the aisle at her wedding. Aww. I mean, uh, it's a, it's an incredible story of, of how despair was overcome by hope and, and what I call a prophet of hope, like uh, Sheila. Uh, and of course, uh, since then, dear, dear Candace has passed by, by natural causes and, and, and a natural death. And God rest her soul. But man, I look at that story and I go, oh, my gosh. And then I compare that to another story when I was in the Netherlands uh, filming and I, I went to a, uh, I went during euthanasia week to, to one of the uh, conferences. And this was a conference for, yeah. for young people. And I met a, a young woman, 30 years old, named uh, Aurelia. And Aurelia uh, self uh, told me herself that she had psychological issues, that she had been suffering for, for a number of years. Uh, but she, she wanted to die. She wanted euthanasia. But she couldn't get it because her GP said, no, we're going to give you coping mechanisms. We're going to try and we're going to keep on uh, uh, assisting you to cope with these and, and look for new advances. But she was determined. And so she, uh, along, with the, uh, uh, um, uh, along with a number of other people, uh, were pushing for euthanasia for people with psychiatric uh, illness. She ended up getting her wish during the production of the film. She 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 emailed me, said I got what I uh, I got what I wanted from the doctor at uh, and this particular doctor was from the end of life clinic, a, a clinic that operates outside the healthcare system. And before I had finished the film, the doctor had already uh, euthanized uh, Aurelia uh, to the to 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 cheers and to much support from her community, and. While I don't think any of those people were bad or the doctor was bad, I believe this is what happens to a culture over time when we say we're going to impose these laws and we're going to put these laws in. Then all of a sudden, some lives are worth living and some lives are not. Yeah. And so then the bar gets pushed. From, from terminally ill to the, to, to the uh, psychologically ill, to chronic illnesses. Now we're talking about euthanasia for children. We're talking about euthanasia for people who just feel their life is complete. They say that there are no, oh, there's no slippery slope. Well, come on. If there isn't, why are we talking about suicide on demand, which is really what the completed life rationale in the Netherlands is all about. So one of the things you said there, Kevin, was you talked about people's sense of compassion. And I agree with you. I would imagine that Aurelia's friends felt that they were helping her. You know, they felt that they were showing her compassion in enabling her or, you know, as you said, almost like urging her on to take her life because they felt that's what she wanted. And they felt that what her, her, she deserved or she was an autonomous person that she wanted and she should have been able to, to do that. But I think we have this in some ways, words like compassion have been turned on their heads, you know, that we want to tell ourselves that it's compassionate to help someone to kill themselves. But I think we actually know that perhaps the harder thing for us as a society is to do better, you know, to make sure that we don't have a situation where people feel that their life is a burden. You know, it's so disturbing to read in Washington State, and you see there's a number out of there, that most that 56% of people who die by assisted suicide say it's because they don't want to feel a burden. And it's harder for us as a society to, to try to deal with that than just simply to say, well, if that's your wish or if that's what you want to do, go ahead. And I know one of the people we've spoken to who's been really interesting um, for, for the conference that we had before Christmas and, and, and otherwise is Professor Theo Bohr, who's a Dutch yeah. ethicist. And he talked about, you know, this that he has lived through the experience of the Netherlands and he was 
firstly in favour of legalising euthanasia, but now he has seen how, how the slippery slope is real and how it has spread. And now you have people um, being given the right to take their own life with the assistance of a doctor or having a doctor end their lives because simply because they feel broken or because they, they have a feeling of despair. And we're not addressing that. We're simply letting them end their lives instead. And what, what message would you have Kevin, for Ireland right now, you know, both as a Canadian who is living with the experience of um, assisted suicide being legal in your country, and as a filmmaker who's made this amazing documentary and talked to the people who are most impacted by the legalization of assisted suicide, what would you tell Irish people to do? Well, we have to get engaged, first of all. We have to understand, like, watch this film, even if you're on the fence. I, when I was in Australia and we, we I, I, a man and I, we had screened the film, uh, a man came up to me after the film and he says, Kevin, I came in here on the fence. I really didn't want to come here. He said, but you shifted me out of neutral. You shifted me out of neutral. And now I'm engaged. I realize that this necessarily doesn't necessarily have to do with the very few, those few cases that we hear about in the media. This has to do with my person, with my friend with special needs. This has to do with my aunt or uncle that has just received a life uh, threatening uh, 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 um, a diagnosis. And this has to do with children. This has to do with what happens to future generations if we put these laws in place. So one, get engaged, talk to your, uh, talk to your uh, government representatives, um, yeah. but be informed as you do and understand that this is not about what they're talking about. This is not about autonomy. It's not about compassion. If we look at the word compassion, the word compassion is to suffer with. It never means to end. And, and it's not about safeguards because we know safeguards Who's, who's the gatekeeper of the safeguards? They just keep getting pushed and pushed. We live in a democratic society. If it's good for him or her, why can't it be for me? Hippocrates knew this. So understand the dynamics, first of all. Talk to your, talk to your uh, government representatives. And the second thing is the very simple things to reach out. Who in your circle is a person that needs your support, that could, that could benefit from you to go get their groceries, uh, somebody with special needs, a person with a disability. Who are those people that might fall to that next level of despair saying, my life yeah. is not worth living? And, and reach out. And what I call my, my, my ministry uh, on the other side of a filmmaker is called Prophets of Hope. Become that prophet of hope to someone else. And then when you are in that situation, when you feel your life is no longer worth living, reach out to those prophets of hope in your life and understand that it's not about what you can do that makes you human. It's about who you are. You are a friend. You are loved. You are a gift. And those are the things that we have to remember practically, it, practically speaking, and also reaching out to our government and saying, this is no good. We don't want to go there. We're better than this. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think everybody watching will know why you made such a compelling and moving and important and compassionate documentary on this issue, Kevin, because you obviously bring your soul and all of that tremendous compassion you have for other human beings to this project. So again, for everyone who's watching, I remind you, it's Fatal Flaws. It's a free screening of this really important and compelling documentary. You can see it um, on the Life Institute by going and registering at the Life Institute.net or going to our Facebook page and following the link and registering there. But please do it. It's incredibly important. If you have friends or family you feel benefit from watching uh, Fatal Flaws, get in touch as well, register the, them as well, and we'll see you on Thursday. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liam. <laughs>